hoping we would uh, have President Hines here at our start. Um, and if your president is here, you definitely want to acknowledge and recognize that fact. Uh, so, so if there's a, a shout or two when he comes in, you'll know where it's coming from, right? Uh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah, well, darn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> On behalf of the philosophy faculty, the Department of Humanities, the School of Arts and Sciences, and the University, I am pleased and honored to welcome you to the fifth annual Southeast Philosophy Congress. I am especially pleased to welcome you to this keynote presentation by my friend, mentor, and former most warmly welcoming and helpful and stimulating, all those things, yes, professor, during my graduate days at Emory University. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob is rather the, I would say, exemplar of a teacher-scholar, which is something academics aspire to. Uh, he is, his work is really interesting, and it takes place at the intersection of philosophy, science, and religion. And we will... <laughs> President Hines! I told them if you showed up, I, was, I thought we were going to stop the show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, and we absolutely appreciate Dr. Hines' support for what we're doing here. And it's a pleasure to have, have you present, Dr. Hines. Thank you. You just, because there's counterintuitive in the, in the title that you appreciate. <laughs> well, it's nothing like explanation, huh? <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, really exciting work. Uh, we were talking with uh, Dr. McCauley about it even over lunch, and I think he has so much to say that it, this may well extend into the wee hours. Well, not really. But it could. Um, now let me say a few more formal things about uh, Dr. McCauley. Robert N. McCauley is here is William Rand Keenan, Jr., University Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture at Emory University. He earned a PhD from the University of Chicago. His research examines the philosophy of science, especially the philosophy of psychology and cognitive science, as well as the cognitive science of religion and naturalized epistemology. He is the author of just last year, this is out just in 2011, Oxford University Press, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not. And he promises you in that book <laughs> that once you reach the end, you will discover, is it seven? Seven. Seven things which will astonish you. And <laughs> that everyone will, will be astonished by at least one of these these uh, secret chapter findings. So go get it, take a read. Uh, he's also written Rethinking Religion, Connecting Cognition and Culture, Bringing Ritual to Mind, Psychological Foundations of Cultural Forms, and he's written numerous articles, papers, book chapters. He's received lots of grants and fellowships, from the American Council of Learned Societies, the British Academy, National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Academy of Religion, and others. He served as president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology, and he is currently the president of the International Association for the Cognitive Science of Religion. He received the Emory Williams Distinguished Teaching Award and was recognized for his outstanding teaching by the American Philosophical Association. Another very important fact you may want to follow up on, Dr. McCauley writes a blog for Psychology Today entitled, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not. A naturalist examines the cognitive and cultural foundations of religion, science, and more. Okay, so check it out, all right? And without further ado, I'm extremely pleased to welcome uh, Dr. McCauley here to talk to us today. Boy, Ron, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ron, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I think in light of uh, the concerns for time, I'll just press ahead, but I'm, I'm flattered, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, the, the talk that I'm going to give today is one that uh, will have four parts to it. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I want to do some sort of as I've said, philosophical and psychological preliminaries. Um, then uh, I want to talk about uh, a particular feature of human cognition, what I've called in my work maturationally natural cognition. Um, <clears throat> that part will explore um, the respects in which human perception, cognition, and action really uh, are inherently theory-laden. Uh, bearing uh, on, of course, philosophers' accounts of perception and uh, likewise of observation in science. Um, then I will turn to just a, a very brief section in which I want to sort of give my take on science vis-a-vis -vis this account of perception. Uh, so, indeed, radically counterintuitive science. <clears throat> and then finally, um, I'll look at the um, in effect, the maturationally natural influences and the implications of their persistence, the, the persistence of these influences. Um, and specifically with regard to some work by, uh, and these are not going to be extended discussions, but by Paul Churchland and by Jerry Fodor, uh, two very prominent contemporary philosophers who have addressed these matters. <clears throat> okay, um, the philosophical preliminaries. Um, I, I think it might be actually, uh, Ron's introduction was quite helpful on this front. I mean, he sort of hit the right points uh, that I uh, needed. Uh, but I uh, sort of wanted to kind of clarify where I stand uh, philosophically for the experienced philosophers in the room, and I know that's the majority of the audience here. Um, and that is, um, <clears throat> most folks sort of use a distinction between continental and analytic philosophy to sort of divide up the philosophical world. Uh, I think that's really kind of a dated view of things. Uh, I think it was actually a dated view 25 years ago, frankly. Um, but um, in each of these cases, there is, it seems to me, a kind of, of uh, uh, a privileging of certain sorts of, of ways of approaching philosophical questions and um, in one, a kind of uh, privileging of what you might say is our interior mental life, and in the other case, uh, you know, privileging uh, particular sort of conceptual structures, our conceptual commitments and the concepts of our, that are uh, manifest in our natural language. Um, I want to clarify, I'm neither of these things, okay? Um, I'm uh, what I would call, and indeed have called, a uh, naturalist. And um, what I'm interested in is sort of this evolution in a variety of, of domains from what we would, what was traditionally called natural philosophy to science. Um, one way, I'm not suggesting by any means that this tells the whole story, <clears throat> or even that it's necessarily the best way to tell the story, but it's a way of telling the story. Um, one way of telling the story of the history of philosophy is, is that philosophy has, has basically spawned sciences. Um, one would argue that this goes back, back at least as far as Aristotle, but arguably to the pre-Socratics. Um, but philosophy has spawned sciences that have inevitably, sooner or later, and especially in the modern era, have come back to sort of make claims about territory that philosophy thought it had a proprietary uh, claim to. Um, so indeed, people started or ceased to describe themselves as natural philosophers and began to call themselves physicists or biologists or chemists or psychologists or, in our own time, cognitive scientists. Um, and indeed, uh, a naturalist is someone who basically is committed to the view that philosophy is not done responsibly if it's not done in uh, light of that work. Um, I mean, the roots of this uh, go back to Quine's assault on the analytic synthetic distinction and his famous paper on epistemology naturalized. Um, the, um, in short, the suggestion is, is that once we've spawned these sciences, and we have, um, that uh, we have an obligation to be attentive to them. Um, as 
Quine famously said, you know, why all the make-believe when we do epistemology? Um, the notion of sitting in an armchair and sort of describing an account of how humans know, we've got sciences that can help us how understand how humans know. And uh, epistemology, for example, done without attention to that is, is I would, I'll be bold. I think it's done irresponsibly. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, on the one hand, um, in short, there's a kind of preference for systematic science over on the other hand. Uh, and note, it's not to say, well, let me back up. On the other hand, ordinary language, common sense, intuitions, available anecdotes, thought experiments, and the canons of logic. Um, all of those things are valuable. All of those things are useful. All of those things are worthwhile. All of those things are things that should be a part of how we carry out our philosophical projects. But they don't exhaust it. Uh, and indeed, when we've begun to pursue systematic sciences and the sciences of language or the sciences of the mind, um, I'm suggesting that we would be prudent to pay attention to them. Now, I want to emphasize I'm not advocating a scientific pro project. There's no intention here of putting anybody out of business. And it's not the case that any of this sort of scientific progress is going to sort of eliminate any of the traditional philosophical questions. They're still going to be there. The question is whether or not we can enrich our answers by, indeed, being attentive to the relevant science. OK. OK, now let me turn to uh, the philosophical preliminaries. I'm on part one now, OK? Uh, or further philosophical preliminaries, I guess is what I should say. Um, Whatever they are, uh, scientific theories are selective. Um, now, I'm employing an extremely liberal naturalistic conception here, um, in effect that, that any system that selects amongst its inputs, in effect, either constitutes or embodies a theory. That is to say, it makes a selection about what's important uh, and what isn't so important. Um, the presumption in the philosophy of science of the, that theory ladenness of perception poses a problem for standard accounts of scientific rationality um, is a long-standing problem now, at least since the work of, of Thomas Kuhn. Um, this is a problem that has sort of dominated thought, uh, really, in the philosophy of science in the sense that uh, there have been projects out to sort of establish some sort of observational foundation for science and for accounts of scientific rationality. Um, this notion of the theory ladenness of perception and observation, however, um, seems to jeopardize that project. Um, now, what I'm going to be arguing is, is that theory ladenness is pervasive. Um, but it is neither as unconstrained as Paul Churchland has envisioned, nor is it as readily managed as Jerry Fodor assumes. And thus, I think that neither of their solutions to this problem are quite satisfactory. OK, that said, um, I want to in effect sort of point out two versions of theory ladenness, so to speak, and they correspond really to two conceptions of cognition. Um, and so now let me turn to a, an important psychological prelim preliminary. Um, in the world of psychology and cognitive science, there is a distinction between, um, well, there is a, let's put, let me back up. Um, the notion that we have uh, dual processing is become a commonplace. Uh, So-called dual processing theories have dominated these sciences now for more than 40 years. Uh, probably the best way to sort of get your attention if you're out there attentive to, you know, bestsellers these days is uh, Kahneman's book on uh, slow and fast thinking. Um, in short, right, the reflective stuff is the slow thinking and the intuitive stuff is the fast thinking. Um, not too complicated really in one way. Um, these are explicit Indeed, let's go ahead and get to this sort of constellation of contrasting properties. Um, reflective cognition is, on, is, is offline, sorry, it is conscious, um, it is deliberate, uh, it is indeed slow, and it's the sort of thought that indeed typically is sort of thinking to yourself in language, so to speak. Um, Lots of philosophers have tried to argue that that's all of thought. I mean, again, I think that's a perfect illustration of what I mean about sort of being inattentive to the science. 
there's loads of scientific evidence that we've got lots of other forms of mental goings on besides just this sort of stuff. By contrast, the intuitive stuff is online, it's unconscious, it's automatic, it's very fast, and it's mostly nonverbal, which is to say that, frankly, what I'm talking about in many cases are forms of knowledge that most human beings have never really even thought about the fact that they have that kind of knowledge. Um, it's going to be um, this sense of cognition and this sense of theory ladenness that I'm going to be most interested in. Because note, on my in, uh, sort of liberal conception of what a theory is, um, both of these would constitute, as it were, selectivity about inputs. And in short, some of them are explicit, some of them are implicit. All right? Uh, I've said what I want to say there. OK, let's go on. Um, OK, now by talking about this kind of intuitive cognition, I'm referring to specific beliefs or actions that arise automatically and, are in, and instantaneously and are held or done without reflection. Now, it ha there are a number of properties here. First of all, you know, this is just, I'm, at this point, I really am kind of pointing to a kind of a general common sense notion about what intuition is like. Um, if I can step back from the talk for a second and just a kind of footnote. I mean, ever since I realized that I had intuition, it's utterly perplexed me. And that is, how is it that humans get into these, to these intuitions? Because I suddenly started realizing that I've got a bunch of intuitions about things that I've never sort of had any explicit education about. Uh, and then I began to realize that there's lots of domains for which this is true. This is, seems to me to be a perplexing and interesting question. but. The kinds of intuitions, as I said, I mean this in the most general common sense notion. Um, note also, with regard to the kinds of intuitions I'm going to be talking about, human beings just presume they're sound. Um, though, in fact, they're utterly underdetermined by the evidence that's available to them. Uh, which is to say, this is part of being fast. Uh, one way Jerry Fodor has put it is to say that these are systems that are stupid. Which is to say, all you need is one or two or three diagnostic cues, and that's enough to kick them into action. Okay? Um, this concerns both what psychologists would call declarative and procedural knowledge, what philosophers would call um, knowing that and knowing how. So, for example, uh, with regard to, uh, let's say, knowing how, right, uh, first off, uh, knowing how, for example, to adjust your gait as you walk across an uneven terrain. Human beings don't sort of stand there and sort of inspect each step to ascertain exactly how they should calibrate their, their walking, their legs and their motions and so on. It's just stuff we do automatically. And most other critters do as well, most other mammals. Um, Likewise, knowing that, uh, knowing that someone is sad on the basis or any emotional state, on the basis of looking at their face, or on the basis of looking at the way they're comporting their body, or on the basis of the tone of their, their, their speech. Likewise, uh, you know, knowing that when the telephone rings at the dinner hour, it's probably somebody trying to sell you something. Right? Uh, I mean, that's another kind of instant inference that I suspect everyone in here has experienced when you're sitting at the dinner table and the phone rings. You don't think, oh my gosh, is it a tragedy in my family? No, everybody knows. They're trying to get us, you know, they want to sell us something. Now, these last two examples I've given are a good way of sort of uh, teasing out, uh, indeed, what I think are the two sources of this sort of intuitive cognition. Okay, um, and what I want to do is focus on one of these. So, let's go here, all right? Um, this is just to sort of uh, exhibit for you what I've called this dual processing account, all right? Uh, but what I'm suggesting is, is that indeed, uh, what I'm going to be interested in is the intuitive stuff. I've told you that. Um, and indeed, what I want to suggest is, is that there are two sources to this, all right? There is so-called practiced naturalness, uh, and indeed, that's what we call second nature. 
It becomes second nature to us to realize that when telephones ring during the dinner hour, because it's happened so many times before, we just instantly start getting these intuitions about who's on the line. That's not what I'm going to be interested in, okay? What I'm going to be interested in is what I'm calling maturationally natural capacities. Maturationally natural capacities are the ones like being able to read human beings' emotional states on the basis of the kinds of cues that I've already mentioned to you. Note, nobody trained you to do that. Nobody taught you to do that. And note also that it's not a terribly easy thing, at least right off the top of your uh, head, to articulate even what the principles are that guide your judgments in those domains. Um, you know, is it a particular way that shoulders are slumped, or is it a particular uh, a tone in a voice, uh, or a particular amount of volume? What exactly is it that leads you to draw the inferences that we all do? And we all do fast, unconsciously for the most part, and so on. You remember the constellation of, of considerations. Okay, indeed, as I've said, what I want to do is focus on the maturationally natural stuff. Okay, what am I talking about? I'm now to part two. What is this maturationally natural cognition? Well, to avoid talk that has run all the way at least in our lives, or at least in some of our lives, I guess I'm one of the old, I think I'm just maybe the oldest person in the room here, or one of them. Um, but talk that runs from, say, Noam Chomsky all the way through to contemporary evolutionary psychology, talk about innateness and innate modules and all that sort of stuff. Um, I have indeed sort of cast this notion of maturationally natural cognition because I want to stress from the outset, I'm not terribly concerned about whether or not this stuff is uh, innate, and I'm also not terribly concerned, finally, if it's modular in the rig rigorous senses that some people use that language. I think it's probably domain specific, and I'll certainly be making that argument. Um, okay. The kinds of uh, domains in question address basic problems. I have in mind here everything from the perceptual recognition of faces to the cognitive discrimination of syntactic distinctions to the action responses to environmental contaminants. In short, I'm suggesting that all three of those domains that I just mentioned are maturationally natural cognition. Face recognition, language, and how to manage contaminants in your environment. Okay? Um, most of them appear uh, pretty early in life, and certainly by school age, most of them are in place. Um, they arise spontaneously. Um, and they rise, and this is crucial. I mean, one, and here's another kind of heuristic for distinguishing these two forms of intuition that I was talking about, the practiced versus the maturational. The maturational stuff is the stuff you have no recollection of when you learned it. So everyone in this room can remember when they learned how to read. But I suspect, and I'm willing to uh, hazard the guess, no one in this room remembers when they learned how to talk. Everyone in this room remembers when they learned how to ride a bicycle. No one in this room remembers when they learned how to walk. And so on. Okay? Um, the, con the, the capacities I'm talking about virtually define normal development, uh, which is to say that as a parent, and I, I'm sure there are many parents in the room, if your kid doesn't manifest these things in a kind of the natural developmental course, you're worried. You take your kid to the doctor. There's something wrong. Um, they are you, uh, sorry, and they are also indeed ubiquitous. Um, okay. Uh, their acquisition does not depend on any culturally distinctive support. It doesn't depend on instruction or schooling or preparations of environments or particular artifacts. Now, there are controversies, as I've said, about whether or not these things are innate or they're modular or any of that sort of stuff. What I do want to say is, is that perhaps not at the beginning, but certainly by the time these systems are up and running, they are domain specific. Um, and there is very little controversy, it seems to me, amongst most psychologists who discuss this um, with regard to um, kids who are at school age. 
That is to say, sort of what they've got. And as I said, these systems are, are pretty stupid. Um, they just have a few diagnostic cues, and they're radically underdetermined by the evidence that leads them to draw the conclusions that we are led to draw. Now note, if you respond stupidly to just a few diagnostic cues, then one of the things that this means is, is that under certain circumstances, we will be subject to illusions. Because, as it were, the cues that are typical and pretty reliable in most settings, of course, can be mimicked in other settings. Okay? All right, what kind of uh, domains do I have in mind? I've already mentioned language. I won't, I won't belabor it. Um, let's move to one that uh, maybe is a little less well-known amongst this group, and that is face recognition. Um, in American English, I never forget a face. Everyone in this room has heard someone say that. Uh, actually, people do forget some faces. But uh, one of the measures of this, and in note, this is, a, this is a rather stronger criterion than anything I've mentioned, and that is the possibility of selective deficits with respect to some of these capacities. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or not, but there is such a thing as a selective deficit with respect to face recognition. There are people known as prosopagnosics who do not recognize human faces. Okay, they can't distinguish individuals from one individual from another on the basis of their faces. Um, at least not without a very long time and a lot of concentration. That's quite overt in, in many of these cases. Um, so, what we're going to do to illustrate what I'm talking about right now is the following. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to show you a face that's upside down. Now the crucial point is this. What I want you to do is I want you to attend to how long it takes for hands to go up when people say they recognize the face. All right? We're, we're, I've got two experiments, two group experiments in this talk, so hang in there. This is the first one. All right. Don't cheat. Don't twist your head. Anybody knows you can do that. That's not, that's not the point. And the point isn't also, don't shout out who it is if you know who it is. That's not the point. The point is, in short, watch the crowd kind of as while you're looking at the face at the same time. Because my prediction is this. What you're going to see is, is there'll be one or two hands that'll pop up pretty early. But in fact, they'll, it'll take a while for some other hands to go up. And there'll be some hands that don't go up at all. Okay, so here's the test. Don't twist your head. Okay, as soon as you think you, you don't even have to know the name of the person. When you recognize the face, you may recognize the face and have forgotten the person's name. Note, I've got about six hands up. Now there went another one. And now another one. And note, there's still a lot of hands that are not up. All right? This is Michael Caine, well-known British actor. Okay, now what's the point here? The point is what just happened. What just happened is, even, I mean, at least for those of you who know who Michael Caine is, I mean, I realize there may be some folks who don't know him, okay, but as soon as you saw his face, you heard it around the room. People said, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Instantaneously, you recognized the face when it was in its proper orientation. Prosopagnosics, on average, take the same amount of time to process an upside down face as they do a right side up face. That's a deficit. Especially since we noted that there were a number of people who never got him at all. Okay? All righty. There's Michael. Good. Um, indeed, the contrast is the point. Okay? Um, this is, and many people want to argue that face recognition, and I certainly want to argue this, face recognition looks like it might be a domain-specific, maturationally natural capacity. There's actually a great deal of literature on where this is literally instantiated in the brain. Um, okay, uh, other domains that I'm talking about. Well, the basic physics of solid objects. Uh, research with young babies shows that even though four-month-olds cannot talk, this is, I mean, if you don't know any developmental psychology, let me encourage you to introduce you to a wonderful field that has just become so exciting over the last three decades because developmental psychologists have figured out how to know, how to figure out what babies know even though they can't tell you they know it. Okay? Um, Four-month-olds are extremely sensitive to the notion that two things 
cannot occupy the same space at the same time. They know that. Interestingly, my guess is this will be contrary to most of your intuitions in the room, at four months of age, they do not know about gravity. That comes in by six months of age, typically. Okay? Um, I can discuss the designs with you, but there's a lot of evidence that this stuff is in place early and they've got it. Okay, theory of mind is probably the most uh, well-known and that is among, among the tasks that, uh, that infants have to solve is they've got to figure out what things in their environments have minds. What things are agents? Um, and indeed there is evidence that again at four months of age babies are very, very sensitive to this information. Uh, again, I can discuss the uh, uh, examples with you or the research with you. Uh, another one I've already mentioned, contamination avoidance. Um, this might strike you as a very odd thing, but uh, the long and the short of it is is that nobody teaches three-year-olds that, uh, well, actually, let's go to four-year-olds. You need to get up to about four because culture does infiltrate these systems. Obviously, it does if I've included language. What culture you're in determines what language you speak. Likewise, it turns out that lots of the things that you take to be a contaminant are things that are culturally specific. But once the system is in place, the principles seem to apply across all cultures. Everybody knows that if I'm contaminated, one touch is all it takes. And we now know who else is contaminated in the room. Four-year-olds know this. Nobody's taught them. My guess is this is the first time for most of you, this was the, ex the first time you've ever heard that principle explicitly. Moreover, you know that he's con capable, it may be the case, that he is completely contaminated. He's not just contaminated at that spot where I touched him. And Alex is going down in flames. There we go. <laughs> All right. When I was a little kid, this game was called Cooties. Okay? Uh, it turns out it's all over the world. Culture after culture after culture has it. Okay. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of nice illustrations about this, but I, I, I'll, again, I'll talk about them afterward. Okay. Um, this is what I mean by maturationally natural cognition. This is what I mean about it being automatic, about it being pervasive, and about it being, in effect, theoretical. That is to say, it makes all kinds of selections on the basis of just a few cues. That's to say, those cues are what are important. And that's what it attends to, okay? Perfect illustrate, actually, let me give you one more illustration of how nicely this will work, because I guarantee I'm gonna get your intuitions on this. Here in the South, we are all quite familiar, oh, sorry, not everybody's a Southerner here, that's right. Um, I've now lived in the South for 29 years. Uh, for those of you who are new to this uh, region, who've just flown in for the conference, we have here um, insects that are um, the size of mice, okay? Uh, and they're euphemistically called palmetto bugs, okay? These are big roaches. That's all they are. Be clear about this. They are roaches. They're in that genus, okay? Uh, these are gigantic roaches. Now, everybody probably also, unless you spread an awful lot of poison in your house, has had uh, one of these once in a while in your home. Um, you know, well, let's put a roach in a sterilizer. Let's get him nice and sterilized and then let's let him run across your plate. Okay, ah, see I've already got it. You're not going to eat off that plate. Even if you know the roach is sterilized, let's let a ro roach do the backstroke in your Kool-Aid, okay? And then pull him out, pour the Kool-Aid out, sterilize the glass. Are you going to drink from that glass? No. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's the point. Okay. <laughs> Let me turn to part three now. Uh, as I said, this is going to be the sort. Of, this will be a fairly short section. I just want to sort of give my characterization of science um, in this context. The science is reliably advanced, usually sooner rather than later. Representations that are radically counterintuitive. That means these representations depart drastically from the deliverances of our maturationally natural perceptual and cognitive systems. In short, when we do science, we learn that these systems aren't so great. And among other things, we learn that they're highly selective. Um, science reorders, it recategorizes, it regroups. 
uh, by way of a number of unobvious regularities based on what are often imperceptible mechanisms and forces. Now radically counterintuitive findings um, about all kinds of ordinary things are just routinely generated by our science. The earth moves. We're all spinning right now at about a thousand miles an hour. Everybody in the room knows it, but nobody has much of a sense of it. I'll come back to this one in a bit. Okay. Um, solid objects are actually mostly empty space. That's what our science tells us. Our biological distinction between the sexes is problematic. That is to say, there is what are known as CAIS females. Okay, these are complete androgen insensitive syndrome females. Okay, these are people who are genetically male. They've got a Y chromosome. Okay, but morphologically, they are females. They're typically sterile, but they are females. Okay, if they have the case, now this is when the case gets, this is when the situation gets really interesting, and that is if it's in a really, uh, if they're really insensitive to uh, all of these androgens, um, it's the case that in fact they will begin, they will look like females until they reach puberty, and at puberty they will begin to literally generate penises. Okay? Now, biological distinctions are sort of folk or intuitive biology. All of a sudden, it looks rather problematic, let alone what Darwin did, okay? Which is indeed radically counterintuitive also. Um, Anton syndrome in the psychological world, one of my favorite cases. I don't know, was I even talking about that in those years, the back of those days? I'm not sure. What is Anton syndrome? Anton syndrome is blindness denial. That is to say, all sorts of philosophers make all kinds of pronouncements about what we must know and what we clearly have to be able to know. But whether you know it or not, there are people in the world who are blind who do not know they are blind. Okay? Anton syndrome. It exists. It's a real thing. It's out there. It's in every city in America. In every city, every major city in the world, actually. There, you'll find these folks. Many, most of them end up being institutionalized. Okay, radically counterintuitive findings of science. Okay, let's go back and see whether or not it's the case that uh, sort of having these new scientific theories can sort of have an impact on how we see the world. Without a doubt, the foremost spokesperson for this position is Paul Churchland, uh, a wonderful philosopher, um, and, I, uh, and a guy who's just had a huge influence on my own thought. One of the examples that Churchland offers in one of his early books, and I still think it's the, ve the best example he's ever given, is of sort of looking at the night sky. Okay? Everyone in the room knows that issue about us moving a thousand miles an hour, right? We're all Copernicans. We all know we're Copernicans. Even though, and we all know that everything is moving at a thousand miles an hour that's near to us, so it's sort of, that means we don't notice it. Though there are, you'd be astonished at the number of people who think that this is why the clouds are moving in the sky. Okay, the Earth's turning and the clouds are staying still. Okay, no, that's not why the clouds are moving. All right, uh, the clouds are moving with us and the Earth and everything else. Okay, Churchill makes a simple point, and that is, is that in fact human beings almost never look at the sky as Copernicans. We look at the sky as pre-Copernicans. But he points out correctly, I can say this from first-hand experience, that in fact you can learn to see the sky as a Copernican, and especially at night, and especially just as the sun is setting, and especially if you're on the east side of a large body of water where the, uh, the sun is setting in the west. So it's real good to go out to the Pacific coast. For me, it was, um, it's always been the uh, east coast of Lake Huron in Ontario. Um, that's what it's like to see the sun, uh, the sky as a Copernican. And Churchland warns you, and he's quite correct about this. This is why I recommend doing it near a body of water, because you'll probably be on a beach. And it means that if you experience vertigo, the worst that will happen is you'll fall into the sand. Because, believe me, he is correct. It induces vertigo. Okay? 
His notion though is, his point is, is that this is something we can teach ourselves. And he's right. Once we have the theory, the theory changes our perception. It changes a whole bunch of things, okay? But of course, one of the other things about this is, is that as soon as you get away from that special setting where it's easier to pick these things out, you snap right back into seeing the sky as a pre-Copernican again. Um, okay, that indeed leads me to the last part of this talk. Um, that is to say, what I'd like to talk about now is the influence of these maturationally natural capacities and the implications of their persistence. Um, these are illustrations from research, uh, they're after illustrations of research, they're actually my own illustrations, but uh, of research carried out by Mike McCloskey at Johns Hopkins on people's physical intuitions. Okay. Um, and um, in short, what he finds is, is that an overwhelmingly large number, the task in the bottom case, where's my, there it is, oh, okay, yeah, you can sort of see it. The task in the bottom case is to move a little puck across a tabletop so that it crosses that border and this border of that semicircle, or sorry, that, that quadrant um, without touching either of the sides, okay? And what he in fact finds is, is that there are very large numbers of naive subjects. The majority of naive subjects will attempt to do it this way, which is to say they think that they can, they can impose a curvilinear motion to the puck. Okay? Well, you can't. All right? Up here is the issue about, you know, sort of uh, what's the path going to be when uh, somebody who's spinning uh, you know, this thing over their head with a, a weight or a ball or something out at the end, when they let it go. Okay, and again, indeed, lots and lots of naive subjects give this answer. I'm afraid that's not the correct answer. It will go at a tangent. Okay, so note, we first of all got a lot of bad intuitions about all sorts of physical processes. Um, I'm afraid, uh, well, in fact, what, it, what most people have is a sort of an impetus theory of uh, projectile motion. The impetus theory, this is a drawing from the 16th century by uh, the Dutch uh, painter uh, Walter Hermann Reif um, of, in effect, an illustration of the impetus theory. The impetus theory holds that, right, there are three different components. This is not showing so well, okay. There are three different components of this motion. This is from the cannon up to B, when it ceases to have a linear motion and begins a curvilinear motion until it gets over to G. And then when it gets to G, the curvilinear motion D, uh, dissipates and indeed it falls straight down to F and D, okay? Um, if you have that intuition, it's not right. That's not the, that's not the path of that cannonball, okay? Um, but I'm afraid, and now you think, okay, come on, no, I don't have much experience with these things. I mean, that's not the sort of thing that we would... But alas, uh, it turns out that on even some of the most basic everyday things, uh, humans are lousy. Okay? The question is very simple. This is a, here's a problem. Okay? The question is very simple. This fellow's running along just like I'm running along right now with this, with this thing. Okay? Where do I need to drop it? Or sorry, when do I need to drop it or where? Both. Okay? If I'm going to hit that case, where do I need to drop it? Okay? So we've got a number of possibilities. They don't have a case there. They just show you the three possible trajectories. Okay? So we got three possible answers here. Naive subjects, the majority of naive subjects get this wrong. All right? Most subjects give the answer B. All right? In fact, that is incorrect. The answer is A. Got to see the letter. <laughs> um, and you'll be interested to know that 10% of naive subjects give the answer C. All right, but that's not the crucial point about this little illustration. The crucial point about this illustration is, is that McCloskey did this experiment with people who had finished either a full year of high school physics or one semester of college physics and who had taken basic mechanics and as soon as he brought them into the lab and posed this kind of problem to them, more than 25% of them returned to the answer B. 
even though they had just successfully completed a course in basic mechanics. And you can't get much more basic than this as far as mechanics goes. Okay? Uh, that is evidence of what I'm calling this reintrusion of these maturationally natural dispositions and judgments. Okay. I'll be happy to talk to you about the 10% who give the answer C. I'll be happy to talk to you about any of this. But the crucial point is this. Even ordinary phenomena, and this is pretty ordinary. I mean, we don't do it every day. We don't even see it every week, but we do see it periodically. We attempt it ourselves when we're hurrying, when I'm hurrying out of the house and I've got to get something on some place and I'm heading to the carport, right? Um, but even ordinary phenomena pose perceptual, explanatory, and predictive problems that go completely unrecognized. Most people most naive subjects have the wrong answer and they don't even know that there's a problem about the answer they give. Okay. That said, let me turn to the implications of what I mean by the persistence of these capacities. There are a few grounds, I think, for optimism about Churchland's project of sort of trying to get us all re-educated. I mean, most famously, for those of you who know this literature, he wants to re-educate us about our own interior perception as well. And that is to say that if we can learn good neuroscience and good cognitive science, we will give up our folk intuitive psychology. Um, I'm suggesting I don't think that that's likely to happen, and it's not going to happen because these systems are built in in a way that in normal human development are just going to flood us all the time. They are automatic. They don't go away. Okay? In light of a whole other constellation of problems, having to do with such things as, right, as I've said, the persisting, these persisting intrusive maturationally natural theoretical assumptions, difficulties in assessing things like probabilistic uh, evidence, uh, inferential foibles, uh, confirmation bias, and so on. Uh, in short, what I'm suggesting is, is that science is radically intuitive, not only in terms of its products, but in terms of its processes. To do science requires a lot of education, it requires a lot of mastery of very complex normative systems of inference, mathematical, probabilistic, deductive, and so on, that all of the experimental literature shows that humans are rotten at. Okay, And interestingly enough, of course, Tversky and Kahneman became famous by showing that scientists are not so great at that either if you put them out of their milieu. If you just shift the problem a little bit in a way that they're not quite used to seeing, they fall back into these same kinds of, of in short, heuristics that see, look like they're built in. Um, I can say more about the inferential foibles. Um, there are famous studies, I've got slides at the end afterward if people want to look at them, uh, where I will show you how hard it is to carry out the most basic inferences that everyone in here has learned and many in here have taught. Okay. Um, yes, I'll read a point here. Science is difficult to do, it's difficult to learn, it's difficult to retain, in part because it's radically counterintuitive. Okay. Now, I've posed a problem for Churchland, but nothing so far that I've said would definitively impugn Fodor's proposal for managing theory ladenness by means of a theory-neutral observational foundation for scientific knowledge. Fodor stresses that uh, that sort of diachronic penetration of maturationally natural perceptual systems that I've been uh, uh, countenancing, say for example with language, um, um, or with contamination avoidance. Again, you know, I mean the notion is kids actually, you know, as parents in here know, at a very, very early age, Kids are perfectly happy to play with all kinds of contaminants. But then they sort of get the cultural input, the systems get tuned in the same way that the linguistic systems get tuned, and now they know what the contaminants are and that stuff disappears. Okay? None of this may pose a problem for an account of scientific objectivity grounded in theory-neutral observation, which is at least the kind of talk that Fodor uh, has been tempted to uh, use sometimes. 
Quote from uh, Fodor in reply to Churchland, actually. Insensitive, uh, insensitivity to local alterations in beliefs and utilities is a necessary condition for the theory neutrality of observation. What seems to be required is just enough diachronic encapsulation, that's a jargony term, but uh, in short, just enough isolation from uh, sort of inputs, uh, the influence of things like culture, to allow perceptual consensus to survive the effects of the kinds of differences of learning histories that observers actually exhibit. Fodor's crucial point here is that we all share the same theoretical biases in these maturationally natural settings and so on the basis of that we can as it were have a kind of story to tell about the observational foundations of our knowledge and uh, achieve a kind of perceptual consensus. Okay. Yeah, I've said that, okay. All right. Famously, if you know Fodor's literature uh, and the work that he's done, he always trots out his favorite case. His favorite case is the Mueller-Lyer illusion. Okay? Now, I told you I'd get back to illusions. Here we are. Here's the second experiment. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this, or even for those of you who are familiar with it, you're going to get a chance to sort of see just how illusory this is. Okay? For those of you, anyone in here never seen this before? Okay, all right, let me say, the, the, the point is very simple, and that is, you got two lines up here. Every human being I'm willing to predict in this room, okay, sees line B as longer than line A. Okay, and in fact, they're not, famously, okay? We can show that the two lines are in fact exactly the same. All right, now note what happens. Note, this is the point. You now know the two lines are the same. You know that. But now they don't look that way, do they? Okay, the point is this. These are persisting illusions. These are illusions that the kind of theoretical concerns that Churchland was interested in saying could change your view of the sky don't seem to apply here because everybody knows the two lines are the same, but you don't see them that way even when you know it. Everybody with me? Okay, good, good, good. Um, yes, this is his favorite piece of evidence. He cited it at least a dozen times by now. Um, and um, it's an argument for why these systems are dumb and what he calls encapsulated. That is to say, no information that you know in other places gets in. Okay, these systems are automatic, fast, dumb, encapsulated, and that's how they work. Okay? Alrighty. Maturationally natural systems indeed kick in on the basis of a few diagnostic cues. Not only are their verdicts underdetermined, but they seem to produce, at least Fodor is betting, on a, univer uh, sorry, a uniform susceptibility to illusions. Except when they don't. This is research from a book that appeared back in the 1960s, a wonderful book that was a collaborative work by anthropologists and psychologists, literally ascertaining susceptibility to visual illusions across cultures. What you will note, first of all, uh, basically the longer the bar, the more susceptible you are to the Mueller-Lyer illusion. Okay? First thing you should notice is, is that the folks who are right out there at the far end, who are the most susceptible of all, are at Evanston, Illinois. Okay? That's an important thing, it's going to turn out. Actually, statistically, you'll be interested to know they are different from every other group in the chart. And I'm willing to bet that basically I've got a population here of Evanston, Illinoisans, even though we're in Atlanta. Which is to say that most of you have grown up in a carpentered environment that has all kinds of straight edges 
And that means it turns out this has an influence on how you see the world. Because there are indeed some folks, sorry, I've got this thing, I can do this, yes. There are some folks who do not. Okay? Um, both the Zulu miners and the San are not significantly different from zero. Okay, that is to say, what this measure is, the PSE on the left side, is the number of inches that the line had to be, in the particular stimulus they had, that the line had to be extended before people said they were the same length. Okay? Now, pretty big line that we were talking about because, I mean, even for the, you know, for the Evanstonians here, it was like 18 inches. Okay? Uh, so we're, we're talking about pretty big stimuli. Easy to see. Okay, real easy to see. Um, interestingly enough, one other population. Uh, you'll notice that there are bars for both adults and children. And you get to the suku and there's a sudden absence here. Okay, and that is to say that there are no suku children bars. That's not because they didn't do the research with the suku children. It's because the suku children were completely, absolutely immune to the Mueller liar illusion. They said the two lines are the same length, the two lines are the same length, the two lines are the same length. Every kid that came through that was tested. So, alas, Jerry Fodor is not correct that we all share this common, as it were, observational foundation. Culture, now note, culture and cultural and material circumstances infiltrate language, they infiltrate contamination avoidance. They infiltrate visual perception. Another interesting finding out of this, now I'm going to really just say something wild and crazy that I've been thinking about a lot, and that is basically uh, there is lots of, there's famous research about the uh, young woman who was found by social workers in LA who had been kept in a closet until she was about 13, and she basically knew no language. Um, they took her off, she learned, began to learn a little rudimentary language, but she never was able to formulate well-formed, extended, you know, English sentences beyond about three words. Um, looks like there might be some critical period here for acquiring these capacities. Interestingly enough, with regard to this, you'll note that they talk about the South African miners. If you knew about South Africa back in the 1960s, uh, what this meant was people who were confined to the most remote and uh, least uh, uh, fertile areas of South Africa, uh, and then at a certain point in life were brought in or were all grew up at a point you know, where they could get, as it were, compete in the labor market and they would come into the cities and try to get jobs. Okay, what they found was is that if they came into the cities after they were 20 years old, they were immune. They did not have this susceptibility to the Mueller liar illusion. If they came in before about 20, 22 years of age, and they spent a little time in the carpentered environments, then they started to show susceptibility to the Mueller liar illusion. Culture is penetrating your visual system until you are in your early 20s, which also just happens to coincide with about the time that human brains reach full growth, except for the generation of specialized neurons in certain areas where you get lots of practice naturalness. So the famous studies about the London taxi cab drivers. Okay? Uh, brains Basically, in terms of their basic growth, stop at about page, uh, about age 23. That's just about the same age, give or take a year or so. And, excuse me, in terms of the findings about what, as it were, sets in, a, as it were, a permanent immunity to certain sorts of visual illusions. Okay, last slide. Um, Fodor, who has argued that perceptual uh, input systems, I'm going to read this to you just to make it go quickly. Um, Fodor, who has argued that perceptual input systems are quite like the linguistic input system, may be more right than he realizes. Some aspects of visual perception, at least mo those responsible for susceptibility to the mueller liar illusion, may in fact be quite like language, and other maturationally natural systems, such as contamination avoidance, by virtue of the cultural infiltration and thus the theory-ladenness of their operations. 
If so, this is not happy news for either Churchland or for Fodor. Churchland will not care for the suggestion that the plasticity of visual perception and perhaps a host of other perceptual and cognitive predilections in adults may be irredeemably constrained on some fronts. You bring those minors in when they're 24, all of that experience in the carpet environment for the next 30, 40 years of their productive life has no impact on their ability with how they see the world. Conversely, Fodor will not be pleased by the suggestion that the influence of what look to be culturally contingent factors can result in adults who cannot help seeing at least some things differently. These outcomes suggest that any argument for any observational foundation of scientific knowledge and of scientific rationality may be a lot harder to make than many philosophers have suspected up to now. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, I'm supposed to give you that. Too. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is just a basic one. What distinguishes the types of individuals who uh, don't fall prey, to you? or do are there individuals who, on a wide spectrum, don't fall prey to these types of illusions, rather than those that do fall prey to them? So even like within a Uh, okay, uh, with regard to the illusions that I was talking about in contemporary, I take it by contemporary culture, what you mean is here, okay? Uh, basically, if you grow up in a setting like this, you're going to fall prey. There isn't any, you don't, you don't find exceptions. Okay, I mean they did that research with the people in Evanston and it's not only that you're susceptible, you've got a huge susceptibility to the illusion. Okay, I mean compared, like I said, that particular population is statistically significant from all those other populations that were represented, even the ones that themselves had a moderate level of susceptibility to the illusion. Um, a quick comment about this, about our, our susceptibility to these things and how quickly it can be induced. Look, let me give you the most simple, casual, familiar illustration you could ever want. You realize that all of Hollywood is based on the ability to trick your perceptual systems. It's called watching movies in a movie theater. And I'll tell you how to dispel the illusion instantly. Get up out of your seat, walk down the aisle to the front, and stand right beside the screen like this. And all of a sudden you'll realize that all people are looking at is a bunch of flashing lights that are changing and altering on a two-dimensional surface. Yet you have experiences of depth, of motion, of coherence of action. I mean, indeed, you're inducing, uh, you have all kinds of inferences about agents. I mean, it, every system starts kicking in. But it's a visual illusion. You're not seeing real people there. Think about it, for example, in those, especially back in the 30s, I, uh, you know, been gone with the wind when Rhett and Scarlett, you know, have those lockups and they're really, you know, this is in their happy part of their uh, relationship. Uh, and the camera in those days would move in and all of a sudden, whether you realized it or not, no, my guess is no, no sense of computing this at all. You were looking at, at heads that were 30 feet high. But that's not how we process it. It's just we've moved up close. That's how we process it. We're all susceptible, I'm afraid. Yeah. Follow that up because I thought I thought you were asking, asking something different, so I'm going to ask you. How what would distinguish? How would, would we know if one of those people was among us, one of the people right now here that wasn't susceptible to the, to the illusion? What would distinguish the Mueller liar? Would, would that person stick out? Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, I, I, no, I mean I uh, there, but there are some people right who will. Uh, I mean, for example, prosopagnosics, um, prosopagnosics are interesting. You know, they, you'd think they'd stick out right away. Somebody who can't recognize you on the basis of looking at your face. But in fact, most prosopagnosics figure out how to sort of solve these problems. And this is an important point about prosopagnosia. 
And that is, most prosopagnosics don't know that they're prosopagnosics. And almost none of their doctors know that they're prosopagnosics. Because prosopagnosia, until about 10 years ago, was uniformly understood to be an injury to the brain. And so if you had a prosopagnosic, you knew it. A lot of them were from, literally, from fencing accidents. Sometimes those little tips go off and somebody gets a sword right through their head. Okay, they become prosopagnosics. About now, 12 years ago, it was actually the year 2000, developmental prosopagnosics were discovered. That is to say, some people are born prosopagnosics. They don't know that they're prosopagnosics. Their doctors don't know that they're prosopagnosics because almost no clinicians even know about prosopagnosia. Famously, one of them, uh, there was a website set up once Brad Duchesne discovered this, and he set up a website for people who thought they might be developmental prosopagnosics. And one guy wrote in, you know, and talked about how all his life. Now, note, but it's not impossible to identify people on this basis. I mean, note, first of all, if they talk to you, you have the ability to pick up a telephone, hear the voice of somebody that you know that you haven't spoken to in two years, and recognize them just like that. Not always, but often. Okay? So, I mean, if they've got acoustical cues, if they've got, if somebody's talking, I mean, you can still, a prosopagnosic can still identify his spouse or her spouse, right? I mean, they know how they talk, they know how they move their bodies, people have characteristic ways they move, they have certain clothing they wear. So it's not as if they just have to bumble through life. One fellow wrote in and said that he uh, had always thought, you know, there was, he was seemed to be just a little less sociable. He'd say, you know, he'd walk around at school and all the other kids would say hi, hi to each other. And he was always trying to sort of figure out how they knew who everybody was. <laughs> but the way he had done males was very simple, and that is he learned about the belts that males wear. Because most males don't have a lot of belts. They simply have one or two that they routinely wear all the time. And then he joined the armed services. <laughs> And he ascertained that he was a prosopagnosic in a matter of four days. <laughs> because, of course, everybody had the same belt. <laughs> Finally became an explicit issue, right? Yeah. Uh, most of the time with regard to these kinds of, you know, the ways that culture infiltrates uh, visual perception uh, are probably not going to be manifest in any way other than rather these rather more sensitive kinds of tests that you can bring to bear. Uh, but they are detectable. Quick comment about that. The, the Campbell, Herskov Siegel, Campbell, and Herskovitz, uh, Don Campbell, uh, actually an old uh, friend, yeah, friend of mine, uh, was one of the authors of this book. I'd never known that he had written the book until about 10 years ago. And I found this book. Um, they actually didn't just check the Mueller liar. They checked five visual illusions. And what they found was is that if you were not susceptible to the Mueller liar, you were probably not susceptible to most of the others as well. So it's, it is a fairly systematic kind of finding. There's real, there is a real impact on your visual perception. Yeah? Um, if somebody does not develop what you t uh, term mutual rationality, because they don't develop language in their process diagnosis and all of this, how does that affect their developmental process? Yes, I cannot speak. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was thinking, you know, you were piling on the uh, uh, affirmity or the, the the infirmities that these people had. I was wondering how how many do I have to keep track of? All of them. All of them. <laughs> if if somebody actually has tr uh, different difficulties due to language or something like this, how does it develop? How does it affect them developmentally? Oh, well, it, well uh, uh, let's be clear. There are, there are a variety of ways you can have these kinds of different alternative cognitive statuses, okay? As I've said, there's developmental prosopagnosia. It turns out some people, it looks like there's a genetic component here, and it can, you know, you can sort of get messed up. Modularists, by the way, the people who advance the strong modularity view about this, the evolutionary psychologists love these kinds of findings. Because it suggests that, right, you've got a sort of face recognition module, and every once in a while it can kind of come unplugged. That's its job, and that's what it does, and this is the infirmity that seems to be caused by it. Now, there's a lot of folks out there exploring whether or not it's just faces. 
Might it be some other things? Okay? In part to be clear about what the functions are that are at stake here. So there's that possibility. There's the possibility of injury. Note, I mean, in terms of where we set what? We set ourselves as a standard, I suppose, right? I mean, the notion that somebody has a different sort of cognitive or perceptual uh, predilection than we have can also, as I've tried to show, also turn on culture. So there's a variety of different possible sources for these kinds of disruptions, one might say, from at least what people are like in Evanston, Illinois, just to pick on Evanston for a while. Um, hope there are no Northwestern grads here. Um, I don't think I've completely answered your question, though. Um, what I'm asking is, you don't develop language properly, or you don't develop mm -hmm. facial recognition, you do not develop this intuitive portion of your, of your person in one way, shape, or form. Yeah. Is there a common denominator that affects you, that, that is affected when you are developing? Because you don't, you are lacking one or two ah. intuitive components. In other words, is there some underlying cause that can produce this across multiple domains? That and the answer to that, as far as we know, is no. And um, is there one thing that all of these actually cause you to have some deficiency or proficiency in? Ah, okay. Well, obviously, look, language often plays a crucial role, and so if people have certain kinds of, you know, language disabilities, that, that's a real problem. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, language is a, is, a, is a very, very complex thing, and so there are lots of different kinds of possible problems that can arise. For example, this recognition of people's voices, that's another capacity that there are some people who do not have it. Uh, not many, but there are some. Um, look, let me, let me throw out another juicy one and then I'll get your question, Ron. And that is, there is another one of these domains. If you remember that list I gave you, it was language, uh, face recognition, uh, basic physics of solid objects, uh, theory of mind, which is the one I wanted to get to, and then contamination avoidance. Theory of mind. Theory of mind is this capacity we have for being able to tell that there are some physical objects in this room that have got minds and some that don't. And we know not to appeal to the ones that don't have minds for help. Okay? Might this capacity come unglued? And of course, famously, the suggestion of Simon Baron Cohen at Cambridge University is this is what we call autism. Autistic people are simply people who do not have that theory of mind capacity. And so they treat you the same way they treat other objects. Now, can it be compensated for? Answer, to some extent. Uh, I mean, if uh, Temple Grandin has gotten a great deal of attention in the popular culture now for a, about a dozen years, I mean, she's a very, very high-level performing autist. Uh, she is autistic, though. There's no question about that. Uh, but autists can sort of learn about kind of how you interact with other people in the way that we might learn, you know, Victorian etiquette by reading an etiquette book. You know, a whole bunch of sort of rigorous rules that you try to remember and memorize. And that's how you handle these sorts of situations. Uh, and I, a quick comment about this, you need to understand that all of the capacities that I'm talking about are virtually completely unrelated to standard intelligence. There are people who are prosopagnosic that are all over the normal bell curve and there are people who are autistic who are all over the normal bell curve in terms of the measures of normal uh, of intelligence. So it's not an issue about sort of G, general intelligence. Yeah, Ron. Yeah, we, we have you here and you've done lots of, of, uh, sort of deep thinking about religion. And so I, oh. I, I do want to ask you before we run out of time, um, if you might have something to say about the connection of this research with your interest in religion? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, the title of the book is Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not, Oxford University Press. Um, uh, makes a perfect gift for any occasion. Uh, uh, 
In short, the argument is, uh, yeah, I can formulate it fairly uh, easily because the first two chapters of the book are devoted to sort of explicating this notion of what I call maturationally natural cognition. My argument's very simple, and that is, is that religion is natural because religions the world over basically engage these maturationally natural systems. They cue these systems, and all of a sudden, people know exactly what they have to do. So, for example, remember our contamination system. You want to create a sacred space? Just give people a cue. for a contaminant and they know immediately how they need to treat that sacred space and that they shouldn't touch it and that even just the slightest little touch is enough to violate the rules and so on. Uh, but of course the most far and away the most important one is theory of mind. Uh, humans have a penchant. Uh, remember they're stupid systems. Forget religion for a second. I want the number of people in this room who have never talked to their computer to raise their hands. <laughs> Why? Note what we start doing. We start using our theory of mind. We over-attribute minds. We start use, you know, using theory of mind to deal with these machines. It, it thinks I want to do this, but actually what I really want to do is print this thing. Every, everybody's talked to their computers this way? Yeah? Okay. Those of us who have lived in the North, at least back in the age of the 1970s when uh, uh, cars were not uh, quite as good as they are today, talking to your car, begging it to start on a cold winter day. Begging it, imploring it. Humans have this penchant to over-attribute agency. It's easy to cue agency. Right? I mean, the, the four-month-olds are, are sensitive to it. We know how to do it with robots. I mean, you know, is C-3PO possible? Doesn't matter if he's possible. We know how to understand it just like that. Nobody, you know, you know, when you saw Star Wars the first time, you didn't sit there thinking, gee, I wonder if this is possible. No, you were into C-3PO. I mean, he's doing, you know, he's telling you all the sort of stuff he tells you and does all that. In short, the argument is, is that religion's popular religion. Now, this is, to be ex this is to be distinguished from reflective activity. I'm not saying that you can't carry out system one type thinking. Um, system one type thinking with, re oh, sorry, I got to get it back up here now, yeah. Sorry, I got to get to from the current slide. There we go. All right, let's get the. Nobody. I, in short, what I'm saying is, is that religions overwhelmingly engage these kinds of systems. Okay, but I'm not saying that you can't have reflective thought about religion. Of course you can. It's called theology. Among, I mean, it's not all the reflective thought about religion, but it's it's an important part of it uh, of the reflective thought about religion. But here's a crucial point, and that is theology is not an important part about religion. In this respect, it's not necessary. Religions there have been thousands of religions that have occurred in human history that had not an an iota of theology. Okay, this typically a theology typically arises in literate cultures of religions of the book. Religions that pick special texts and have actual books. That's when you start getting elaborate theology. Okay? So I'm not saying that, that, that um, all religious thought is cognitively natural. What I'm saying is, is the religious thought of popular religion is cognitively natural. Let's just use a, another quick illustration. Because I'm sure that for those of you who live here in Atlanta, I mean, you know, anybody who's lived in the South and is familiar with, uh, you know, Pentecostalism or even evangelical groups or Protestant groups, they're, they're familiar with this. The, the, the religious phenomenon of speaking in tongues, glossolalia. Now, first thing that Christians should learn is, is that glossolalia is not something exclusive to Christianity. It pops up in scores of religions around the world. This isn't something that, that Christianity's got the corner on, okay? And that's 
my point. There are a host of these kinds of systems. There's a whole collection of them. And it turns out that there are, you know, various religions pick among them and sort of exploit some of them. There are some that get exploited very regularly across almost all religions. So you get myth and ritual in virtually all of them. But glossolalia does not appear in all religions. It appears in some. But what's going on in glossolalia? Think about this for a second. I told you that these systems are dumb, they're cued, and once they're cued, they fire automatically. You can't help yourself. Let me back up and make a preliminary point before this. Jerry Fodor famously and I think wonderfully makes this point about language. Pick any sounds you want except the ones I'm making right now. Because there's a difference in these sounds. You can't hear the sounds I'm producing right now as mere sounds. You instantly process it as language. Try as hard as you can, you will not be able to forestall the automaticity of your linguistic processing systems. I trust I have just demonstrated what I was asserting. There may be somebody in here who doesn't recognize Dixie. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no but no, that's not the point. The point is, is that they hear the sounds as sounds. They are not hearing it as necessarily meaningful or any of those sorts of things. There's all these you know, constellations of sounds in our environment. But there are certain sounds that jump out at us. And they're ones produced by human voices with particular cadences and having particular sorts of metrical patterns and prosodic fa features. And folks, that's just what's going on in glossolalia. What happens? Human voices start producing certain sorts of patterns of sounds, and what happens to every mind in the room? It instantly infers this is language. It instantly infers from that, if it's language, it must mean something. It instantly infers, if it must mean something, it would be really cool to find out what it means. And you're off and running. This is the respect in which I'm suggesting that all religions engage these maturationally natural systems. Yes? Um, but what if it's a language you don't understand? Would you be able to, like... Yeah, that, that, that's a little trickier, but in fact, think about it. When you hear, you know, foreigners speak a language you don't understand. I mean, the, the, the universal uh, view is always that they're speaking fast. <laughs> no matter what language it is, even if you don't know what it is, it sounds to you like they're speaking fast, right? Um, and, but the crucial question would be this. Can you hear it as just sound? Or can you hear it, process it as language? Now, not to know the language, but that you know this is language, they're speaking language, and again, same inferences. It must mean something. It would be really cool to know what it means. Let's take one more question. You probably should. Uh, if I might, I'll, one quick comment, and that is there's a, another side of the book. Okay, the book is about comparing science and religion. And um, what I argue is, is that if you're going to compare science and religion at this point in time, you owe your reader a rationale for having written such a book. Because if you don't know this, there are the number of books comparing religion and science can fill libraries. There's a zillion of them. So far as I know, mine is the first that compares them on a in terms of their cognitive foundations. All other treatments that I know of are either focusing on, well, theology or epistemology or metaphysics, those kinds of questions. And the second claim, indeed, in order to tempt you all to go out and buy it right away, is, is that indeed I do promise that there are seven surprises at the end of the book. Uh, but I'm also talking about science. And what I'm saying, in short, is, is that science is overwhelmingly this stuff. And it's not to say that you can't get some intuitions in science. Experienced scientists have intuitions, but it's practiced naturalness. It's not maturational naturalness. They've had a long education. They've spent years in labs. They have techniques that they use that they have practiced over and over and over again. So there's intuition and reflection in both domains. My suggestion, though, is popular religion is overwhelmingly this stuff, and at least Explicit science is overwhelmingly that stuff. Last question you said? Yeah. Yes, uh, this is a comment regarding uh, 
when we discussed the experiment and people's uh, the failings of people's physical intuitions when we yeah. all was dropped and a large proportion of people chose B instead of A. And I would posit the hypothesis that the problem there is really with the design of the experiment and that the ex the subject doesn't have empathy when they're looking at such a picture. But oh. If they were actually in such a position that they would run and have to drop a ball, I would argue that they would get it right much more of the time. And in fact, if they were shown a looped uh, I don't know, film of a person running and then were told to press a button when they think they should drop the ball correctly, they would also do it right. Sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> that research, I mean, he did that version of, the, of the, those studies involve both just looking at illustrations like this, but also here's the ball, hit that target as you run across the room. Yeah, same, same kinds of, of outcome. Uh, you get the same kind of, uh, of, in short, I mean, what people don't understand inertia. Right? Uh, they're, they drop the thing straight over the thing, and they don't realize the ball's moving just as fast as they are forward, so it goes and it lands out there. Why don't I end on this? Let's get to it real quickly. Come on, hurry up. Go, 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 go. Just one, oh, there's too many things to go to. All right, remember there was A, B, and C. Remember C? C was the one where the ball falls backwards. 10% of naive subjects give that answer. Why? <laughs> I believe I have the answer. And that is, it's called TV contamination. I think that people probably treat this as if it's like bombing. And most of the experiences people have had until very recently, now we've got a new generation, and this research was done back in the, actually in the 80s. Um, so it was before we had the new kind of uh, you know views from the first Gulf War and the Iraq War of you know the the, the laser guided missiles and all that sort of stuff. All of our experiences of observing bombing prior to that were these old vintage pictures from World War II, and reliably it was always that the camera was directly over the bomb bay door. And of course, if you remember those pictures, which way did the bombs look like they were falling? Backwards. Why? Answer is because as soon as those guys dropped those bombs, they gunned the engines of those planes to get up and out of there because they could get shot down and killed so easily. So they started moving much faster than the bombs, and that's why the bombs looked like they were dropped, drifting backward. I think that's the answer for C back in the 1980s. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.